There is no more important question for you to ask and have a confident answer in than who is Jesus. Now, some of you perhaps have grown up in church, and so this question might feel commonplace. This might feel like an obvious, we've learned about this our whole lives. But I want you this morning to think about this with me. Think about this critically. Who is Jesus? There is no more important question for you to ask, for you to answer. And who is this man, Jesus? What did he do? What was his message? What was his purpose? What is his nature? Who is Jesus? In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus asked this very question. Matthew 16, verses 13 and 15 say, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say the John, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, this is a question that is answered in a thousand different ways. This is a question that every false religion, every non-religion has an answer to that does not accord with Scripture. And so this morning, what I want us to do is to ask And try to wrestle with, what does the Bible say about who Jesus is? Because like I said, there's a thousand different ways that Jesus is defined and described by a myriad of religions. For example, Islam says that Jesus was a prophet. Maybe a good man, but was not the divine son of God. Now they believe in the virgin conception. They believe that Jesus should be revered, should be honored. When they say Jesus' name, they say, peace be upon him. After they say it, they, they have some sense of respect for Jesus. But Jesus was a prophet. He was not the divine son of God. That's how Islam answers that question. Now here's a question about what modern Jews would say about Jesus. Judaism. Well, what is their answer to who Jesus is? Well, they would claim that Jesus was a false Messiah. The Messiah in the Old Testament, the anointed one that would come, the branch of Jesse, uh, the one that would sit on David's throne, they today, to this very day, are still waiting for that Messiah. And they believe that Jesus came on the scene. He was a religious rebel rouser. He had a sect and a cult following. He was a false Messiah. And because of that, he became crucified. He was a martyr for, in their minds, an unjust cause. He was not the right, true, biblical Messiah. And today they still wait in anticipation for the Messiah to step on the scene. So that's how modern day Jews or Judaism would say that who is the question of who is Jesus. Now Hinduism. Hinduism says Jesus was a good teacher. Perhaps he was one of many gods. If you're familiar with Hinduism, they have Lots of gods. They've got tiers of of gods. They've got all kinds of gods. And Jesus perhaps is one of those many gods, but he is not any sort of different or more reverent or more powerful than any other other gods. He he was a good teacher. He he did some good things uh, and maybe one of many gods, but, but nothing else other than that. That's what Hinduism would say. Buddhism would say that Jesus, he was enlightened. Uh, He knew some stuff about life, maybe in a different sort of Gnostic sense. He he was enlightened. He he was an enlightened, wise teacher. And if you follow Jesus, if you follow the teachings of Jesus, you yourself can, on your journey to being enlightened, as Buddha would teach, uh, you can be enlightened, just like Jesus was enlightened. But all that's sort of enshrouded and enshrined in the teachings of, of Buddha. And it's it's an interesting uh, sort of metaphysical type of enlightenment, and he was a wise teacher. Maybe some things that you could learn uh, from him. Now, maybe close to home, I know plenty of neighbors here are Jehovah's Witnesses. What do they say about Jesus? Well, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is Michael the archangel in God's first creation. He is not God. He was created by God. He, he holds a position of authority to be sure. 
But he's the creation. He's God's first creation. He is the, 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 the quote Colossians 1, which talks about he's the firstborn of all creation. See, they would say he is created by God. Uh, he, he should be elevated and honored and all of those things, but he is not God, not truly God. He is Michael, the archangel. He's a messenger of God. He has a divine task given to him by God. He is not God. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses would say. Or maybe even closer to home, Mormons or Latter-day Saints, what do they say about Jesus? Now, this one gets tricky because when you talk to a Latter-day Saint, they're going to say everything that you say. If you share the gospel with them, they're going to say yes and amen. But it, it's not yes and amen, because there's a different Jesus with a different gospel. Jesus has a different nature. He comes from a different place, and all of it is different, even though they would say, yes, Jesus is our Savior. Yes, we believe in the gospel. Mormons, or Latter-day Saints, say that Jesus is the spirit offspring of Elohim, or Heavenly Father. So Heavenly Father, Elohim, God the Father in our context, is one God of an infinite regression of gods that once was a man, that ascended, much like Latter-day Saints, they believe they can, that ascended into deity. And he just happened to be, out of all the infinite gods out there that have their own planets, by the way, uh, out of all of those infinite gods with all of those planets, this one God, Heavenly Father, Elohim, happened to be very gracious, happened to be very generous. And so he creates this world, earth, that we live on, and he has a physical relationship and has a physical offspring, which is Jesus. Lucifer, in this instance, is Jesus' brother. It's an interesting paradigm. Jesus is the spirit offspring of Elohim and Heavenly Father. So he's a different Jesus altogether. So they're going to say yes and amen. They're going to say we believe in Jesus. But they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. And so what we want to do this morning, and I know this is a question, like I said, this is a question that if you've been in church for a while, you perhaps have a firm understanding and a firm response to that question. Who is Jesus? But I want you in your minds, I want you to think about your neighbors, your, your Jehovah's Witness neighbors, or perhaps the ones that knock on your door, or the Latter-day Saints that are in your neighborhood. And if you, by God's grace, have an opportunity to speak the gospel to them, what are you going to say about the deity of Christ, about who Jesus is? Because we're not on the same page. We believe something different than what they believe. They believe something different than what the New Testament authors believe. And so I want you to think about that today as we work through a text that's going to tell us very plainly and very clearly who is Jesus. And in some sense, I want to train you and equip you apologetically to kind of give a defense for who Jesus is according to the Bible. Not Joseph Smith, not Muhammad, uh, not anyone else other than the Bible, the Bible that is God's very inspired Words. And I want us to think about that critically today. So we've got your Bibles open to John chapter 1. We're going to seek to answer this question. Who do we say Jesus is according to the Scriptures? Scripture alone. Who do we say that Jesus is? John chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 1. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without anything was not anything made that was made. And we need to zoom out for a second. We need to ask ourselves, why did John, the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, different people, the Apostle John, why did he write the Gospel of John? What's he getting at? Because if we're going to understand these words in context, we have to understand what John is trying to teach us, what he wants us to know. And that comes from his purpose statement that he gives us plainly in John 20, verses 30 and 31. So John tells us, here's, here's why I wrote this. Oh, I want you to know these things because of this reason. Here's John's purpose statement. John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So he says, there are other things that I could have said about Jesus, other signs, other miracles, other things that I could have included in here, but they're not written in here. So why did he choose the things that he chose? Why did he include the things that he included? We'll look at verse 31 if you're there. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one that was long anticipated from the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. These are written that you may believe that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John says, I wrote this because I want you to know who Jesus is. And I want you to believe in him rightly so that you can have life in him. I want you to experience eternal life. I want that for you. In order for you to get that, you need to understand what is written in this book so that you may have life in believing in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And so that brings us back to our text. How does John begin his argument? You think about a debate. In a debate, your opening statement sets the tone, sets the stage. Here's what we're going to cover. Here's how we're going to cover it. Here's why it's important. And that's what John does in the opening words of John chapter 1. Turn there again. John 1, verse 1. Here's how he begins his argument about helping us to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him, we may have life in his name. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John begins unapologetically. He does not blink. He does not blush. He does not stutter. He says what he says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And John begins setting this argument, laying this foundation by saying, what we know about Jesus is that he is God. That he is God. He is in the beginning. He is with God. He is God. And point number one, today. I want you to confidently affirm the deity of Christ. And I say confidently, because when you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, when you talk to Muslims, when you talk to Latter-day Saints, they're going to undermine this. They're going to doubt this. They're going to reject this. They're going to deny this. And so I want you to see from Scripture why you can believe this with confidence. Why this is something that not just John But every author in the New Testament believes, and this is what they teach, the deity of Christ. Confidently affirm the deity of Christ. Now we need to back up for a second. We need to ask, why does John refer to Jesus as the Word? And how is it that we know that Jesus is the Word? It doesn't say in the beginning was Jesus. It says in the beginning was the Word. So that's a fair question. How can we assign this title, this word, Word, to Jesus. How do we know one is the other? Well, look at verse 14 in chapter 1. It says, In the Word, whoever this person is, became flesh. What does the Gospel of Matthew tell us about Jesus, this baby that's going to be born? You will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God in the flesh. And so the Word became flesh. And by the way, the whole Gospel of John is about Jesus. And he begins saying, I want you to understand that this Word is Jesus, and Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became flesh. So what does it mean? What does this mean? Why is he calling him the Word? What does it mean when John says that in the beginning was the Word? How is Jesus the Word? Well, Jesus, being fully divine, being fully God, is the divine speech or revelation that reveals God. That's what this means. So in other words, you you could say Jesus is the fullest expression and revelation of God in the flesh. And this is what Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In in verse 14, uh, the, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, being fully God, is the divine speech and revelation that reveals God. Now, lest we think that John is off the rails here, and he's the only person in the New Testament that believes this, the author of Hebrews says the exact same thing. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. He says, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, by the Word of God, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That sounds much like our text. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The word of God, Jesus, reveals God because he is God in the flesh. If you want to know what God is like, look to 
Jesus. He's divine revelation. He's divine speech. He reveals things about God. He reveals things about the Father. Why? Because he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So in the beginning was the word, the divine revelation of who God is in the flesh. Now, what does John teach us? What is he telling us about the nature of this person? And this is where the rubber meets the road. Let's start here. John teaches us that the Son of God, the Word of God, is eternal and uncreated. So right off the bat, Latter-day Saints disqualified, Jehovah's Witnesses disqualified, because John's going to tell us that Jesus is eternal. He has always existed, the Son of God. He has never been created because he is not created. He is unoriginate. He is, he just is. He is eternal and he is uncreated. Look at it with me in verse one. In the beginning was the word. Now in the original language, the way that's written, it's in the beginning as far back as you can possibly fathom, as you can possibly go, the word was there. The word was there eternally from the beginning was the word. And just in case you doubted that. He says it again in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. He's eternal and he's uncreated. Now, where have we heard these words before? In the beginning. Where have we heard it? Genesis 1. Good Bible readers. I like it. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens, and the earth. Unoriginate, uncreated. He is eternal. He has always been. He will always be. That's what John tells us in the beginning was the Word. He's referencing very clearly Genesis 1, the beginning of all things. John wants us to think about Genesis 1. He wants us to go there and go, well, wait a second. In Genesis 1, it says in the beginning, God. And he locates the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son, being there, present, with God. He is God in the beginning. Why? Because he's eternal and because he's uncreated. That's what we see first from John. We also see that the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, enjoys eternal fellowship in an eternal relationship with the Father. There is an eternal relationship between the Father and the Son. Look at it with me in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, eternal, uncreated. And the Word was with God. There is a distinction. There is a distinction in personhood between the Father and the Son. Now, we believe in one God. We don't believe in three. We don't believe... We're not tritheists. We believe in one God. We believe in a triunity. We believe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equal one God. But we also see the personhood of the Son being in fellowship eternally with the Father. And the Word was with God. And in fact, if you skip down to verse 14 again, it says, And the Word, the eternal Son of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus himself, he speaks very plainly about this in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 5. He says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. There is an eternal relationship of fellowship between the Father and the Son. And it is marked with love and glory. That's what John points our attention to. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There is a unity, as we'll see, in plurality. That's what we talk about in terms of Trinitarian theology. There's a unity in plurality. The Son is with the Father, and it has always been so, and it'll always be so. That's what John teaches. And next we see that the eternal Son of God the one in eternal fellowship with the Father, is the all-powerful agent of creation. He's the all-powerful agent of creation. Look at verse 3. All things were made 
through him. Now, if we stop there and we entertain the ideas of Jehovah's Witnesses that God or Jesus is the first creation of God, that he has some status of worth or value because he has a unique relationship. He's the created son of God. That's fair in reading the first part of this verse. All things were made through him. It doesn't specify necessarily that Jesus is not uncreated. But if you keep reading, it says, And without him was not anything made that was made. God is unoriginate. He is eternal. He has always existed. He is self-existent. He is not created. And John tells us that apart from the Son of God, there was not anything made that was made. And that would include himself. <laughs> there was not anything made that was made. Why? Because Jesus is the all-powerful agent by which everything is created. Now, this is fascinating because in the Old Testament, the the role of creation is attributed to the Lord, attributed to Adonai or Yahweh. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And so in Isaiah 40, we have the Lord, God, is the creator. But in John 1, we say, he says, all things were made through the Son. And there was not anything made that was made apart from the Son of God. So which is it? Is it the Lord? Is it Adonai? Is it Yahweh? Or is it the Son? I mean, the answer is, is yes, obviously. But in Genesis 1, here's, here's how we can get clarity on this. Genesis 1 tells us how God created the world. So Genesis 1, we read it again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? How did the Father create the world? Well, verse 3, and God said, God spoke. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke and the world came into existence. And what John makes clear to us is that when God speaks, it is the Word of God, the Son of God, by whom and through whom He speaks. And so He created the world through the Son. He's the agent of creation. And so it's not a contradiction that the Old Testament says that Yahweh creates and the New Testament says that the Son creates. It is a unity in plurality. They're both involved in the act of creation. God said He spoke, and He spoke through the Word of God, the Son of God. There was not anything made that was made apart from him. So John begins making it clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now again, if we think, which some have claimed, that John is off his rocker, that John is the only person in the entirety of the Bible, the canon of Scripture, that believes this. If we think that, we just First of all, don't understand the rest of Scripture. Because like, like I said, every New Testament author refers to the deity of Christ. Jesus himself makes it clear. But this is the question. This is the claim, the accusation. Jesus never claims to be God. That's what they're going to say. Jesus never claims that. He never says that. Is that true? Is that true that Jesus never says that? Well, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8. Because I want to show you that that is a bunch of hot air floating around and has no bearing on reality. Feeling a little spicy today. It's a lot of hot air. Look, look at this. John 8, 58 and 59. Because that's the claim. We're evaluating the claim. Does Jesus claim to be God? Or is that just something that either the New Testament authors attributed to him or we, most especially the, the accusation is, uh, and the Council of the Nicene, the Nicene Council, right, to the Nicene Creed. We just made all this up. We just created this. Jesus never said this. We said this about Jesus. Well, let's look at it. John 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, and he's speaking to the Pharisees, by the way, the people who knew the most, perhaps, about the Bible, the Old Testament, especially the, the first five books, the Torah, the book of the law. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. There, 
I don't know how much clearer you could be about Jesus himself saying, I am God. And by the way, the original audience, this is how they understood that. Do you think in verse 59, when they picked up stones to throw at him, to kill him, that that was just some random, you know what, he's a good teacher and all, but let's, let's kill him. That, that's not what's going on here. They understood Jesus is claiming to be divine. And in their minds, because there's one God, Jesus is being blasphemous. And someone who is being blasphemous is worthy in their, in their perspective, and even in the Old Testament, it's prescribed of death. And so they're saying, this man, claiming to be God, is being blasphemous. We must kill him. And so the, the claim that Jesus never claimed or never described himself as God is just not true. It's not what we see in Scripture. And this is just one example. But, but Jesus takes the most extreme example that he could possibly take, I am, and attributes that to himself. Why? Because Jesus makes a, a direct claim that he is God. I am was a title well known to the Jews during this time. It, it was the name of the covenant-keeping God of Israel. It was an intimate term that declared that there is one true God. And yet Jesus says, I am. He attributes that to himself. Now, where does this come from? Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. This is where Moses uh, sees the burning bush. He turns to the side. The angel of the Lord and, the, and Yahweh are there. And God said to Moses, right? This is after he's given instructions for him to go and help free the people of Israel from their bondage uh, to the Egyptians. And Moses says, who do I say sent me? And who am I going to tell them sent me on this mission with this purpose? Well, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And so what God is saying is that he is the self-existent, ever-existing, unoriginate God. He has always been. He will always be. What makes him God is that he's God. I am is what he's saying. And yet what Jesus says is before Abraham was, I am. And scripture consistently affirms that there is one true God. All throughout the Old Testament, Isaiah has an example, Isaiah 43.10 says, you are my witnesses, declared the Lord, declares Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know, may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. God makes it clear, there is no God before me. Mormons disqualified because they have an infinite regression of gods that have all their own planets and have come before. And they were once men and they ascended a deity and all that nonsense. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. And in fact, the Jews would recite what is known as the Shema twice daily to consistently affirm the uniqueness of the one true God. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. They would recite this daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the Lord is the great I am. And yet what Jesus says in John chapter 8, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's taking the most dramatic name for God in the Old Testament that he can possibly think of and says, that's me. Before Abraham was, I am. And there was no confusion by the Jews. They weren't debating. Well, he didn't really say it. He didn't say that. They pick up stones to kill him because they knew what he was claiming and they thought he was claiming something falsely. They thought he was denying the oneness of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And yet Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, why does this matter? Because that was a lot. Why does this matter? What happens if Jesus truly is not divine, if he does not possess deity? What do we lose if this is not true? Well, first I would say, and most importantly, if Jesus is not who the New Testament claims him to be, that he is one with the Father, that he is the eternal Son of God, he is through whom all things were created, through whom all things are upheld and sustained by the word of his power, if that is not true, 
we do not have a gospel. And we do not have a Savior that can save anyone. This is what is at stake here. Because what we see Jesus doing is Jesus came to fix the God-sized problem man faced. You see, our sin before God is not just a man-sized problem. It is a problem that extends far beyond our ability and capability to deal with. Only God can deal with the problem of man's sin. And so if Jesus is not God, he cannot deal rightly and fully with the problem of man's sin. Only God could fix the problem of man's sin. This is what Paul says in Romans 3. This is what Paul says with, with Christ. He, he punishes Christ. He pours out his wrath for your sin and mine so that he could be just in punishing sin. And he had to. He cannot deny his nature. He can be just and the justifier. He can justly punish sin, but he can also justify those who were once sinful but are now declared righteous because of God. And if Jesus is not God, there is no justification. There is no salvation. We can all go home. We can watch the masters in peace, and we can go take a nap because it's not a true gospel. Jesus came to fix the God-sized problem man faced. And listen, men trying to fix the problem— between God and man. And this is a, a silly illustration. But it's like rolling up a cannon in the heat of battle and firing bubbles. <laughs> Confetti. Oh, we're going to get them. We're going to take care of the problem. And, and bubbles just start floating in the air. I mean, it's, it's absurd. We can't deal with the problem. It's not a man-sized problem. It's a God-sized problem. That's what David says. Our, our sin is against God. Against you and you only have I sinned. And so our sin is of cosmic proportions. It's a God-sized problem that only God can fix. And if Jesus is not truly God, he cannot truly provide life. John wrote his gospel so that you would believe in Jesus as the Son of God and have life in his name. And only God has the ability, the authority, and the power to grant life. We need to understand what's at stake. If Jesus is not God, we have no gospel, we have no Savior, we have no hope. So that's the first part of all of this. The second part that John points our attention to, and this is incredible, look at verse 14. And that this word in John 1, 14, this divine message of God, this divine speech from God, the person of the Son of God, who has eternally existed, he's uncreated, he's unoriginate, he's the all-powerful agent of creation, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's, here's the incredible truth that we see in John chapter 1. The eternal Son of God became a man. He is the God-man. This is what Paul says in Colossians 2.9, for in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole fullness of deity. Not some substandard deity that was given to him through his creation. The whole fullness of deity, what we can say of God the Father, we can say of God the Son. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. God became a man. Emmanuel, God with us. So point number two, we'll have to do this quickly. See the necessity of the incarnation. See the necessity of the incarnation. So what is it that we must affirm? What is it that we must believe? Well, it started, we already covered it, Christ truly, genuinely, authentically, and completely is God, has always been God, and will always be God. There has never been a time when Christ, the eternal Son of God, was not God. We must affirm that. John affirms that. Paul affirms that. Peter affirms that. Jesus claims that. This is the testimony, the overwhelming testimony of the New Testament. But we also, in conjunction with that, we must affirm that Christ truly, genuinely, authentically, and completely became a man. Not a quasi-man, not kind of a man, but truly and fully a man. So we could say it this way. In the incarnation, the eternal Son of God added a human nature, thus existing as one person, the eternal Son of God, 
with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. And that's called the hypostatic union, which we won't get into because our brains will melt. But that's what's going on here. The incarnation, the eternal Son of God, added a human nature, thus existing as one person with two natures, divine and human. I want to pause for a second. I want us to think about this. Think about this very practically. What is John telling us about our Savior? What is he pointing us to? How should this make us feel? What, what emotions should this evoke inside of us? Think about how incredible this is. That the God who is over all, who creates all, becomes that which he created. That the God who is high and lifted up lowers himself, taking on the form of a servant. Think about how incredible this truth is. I was reading this book by this guy named Ernst Sartorius. We name our kids like Oregano now. And Ernst, I don't know if anyone here is named Oregano, sorry. Ernst, I'm sure you smell great. Ernst Sartorius, Ernst Sartorius, he wrote a book called The Doctrine of the Person and Work of Christ. Here's how he says this. This is beautiful. Listen to these words. It is glorious to be great and unlimited. It is sublime to be elated and majestic. But it is grander and more sublime for greatness to humble itself, voluntarily to lay aside the splendor of majesty, and out of love to the little and the low, to become little and low. He goes on and says, It is noble to ascend a throne and exercise dominion over others. But it is more noble to descend from a throne and out of love to become the servant of others. This is our Savior. He humbled himself, taking on the form of the servant, humbled himself of obedience towards death on the cross. This is what John points our attention to. The eternal Son of God stepped down from his throne and out of love became a servant of others. Jesus said the Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what do we know about the humanity of Jesus? Well, two things quickly. We know that the, the body that Jesus had was a real human body. <laughs> and that seems obvious, but there are two primary error, errors when it comes to Jesus. You either deny his divinity or you deny his humanity. And either one of those leads you into blasphemy and heresy. So we need to affirm that Jesus had a genuine human body. He was genuinely and continue, continues to be genuinely in a human body. For example, Luke 24, 39 through 34. This is after actually the resurrection. So he has a glorified body, but it's still a human body. He says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat? What is more human than saying, wait a second, guys, can I get a snack real quick? I just, I was dead and I'm alive. I'm hungry. Like, can I get some food? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate before them. It's almost like Luke's wanting us to, okay, he ate before them. They watched him eat. Why is that? That's significant because he's a real man, a real person, and a real body that can be touched, that can be experienced, that can be seen, that can eat food. And they watched him do it. So Jesus has a genuine human body. We also know that Jesus, and this one gets a little bit tricky, but we'll, we'll state it simply. Jesus has a genuine human soul. Jesus himself says this in Matthew 26, 38. This is the Garden of Gethsemane when he's crying out to the Lord, when he's praying. He says, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. So Jesus has true, a true human body. He has a true human soul. He is a man, a true man, God in the flesh. So Jesus grew like us. He grew in wisdom and stature, the, the scriptures say. He experienced fatigue like us. He needed to take a nap every once in a while. He felt hunger like us. He was tempted like us yet without sin. This is what the author of Hebrews 4, 15 says. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So why does this matter? Why must we, aff- why must we affirm that Jesus is both God and man? Why does the incarnation matter? Jesus' incarnation, his humanity, was the necessary means by which the eternal Son of God became our all-sufficient Redeemer and Lord. The eternal Son of God became a man to accomplish the will and plan of God as a man for mankind. Only a man could fix the problem of man, right? But only God can fix the problem of man. Because it wasn't God's problem of sin. It was man's problem of sin. So man needs to fix the problem of man, but man can't fix the problem of man. So God has to fix the problem of man, but he fixes the problem of man as a man, a perfect man, the the God man, the new Adam is what Paul talks about in Romans 5. This is what the incarnation teaches. And it's been famously said that the God could not redeem, God could not redeem what he did not assume representation of humanity required identification with humanity. And if the Son did not become one with us in every way, He could not redeem us in every way. The incarnation and the deity of Christ, the the God-man, is the means by which you and I can say we have eternal life. And here's a summary statement of all this, and I want you to, to take this seriously. Hear me on this. If Jesus is not truly God and truly man, he's no savior to anyone. That's what's at stake. This is what the scripture teaches. If he's not fully God and fully man, he is no savior to anyone. And yet what John teaches is that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He says in him in verse four was life. And the life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Our Savior descended from a throne, took on the form of a servant, lived the perfect life, became sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. If, God, if Jesus is not truly God and truly man, he's no Savior to anyone. And yet what we see in the scriptures is that both of those things are true. And because both of those things are true, we can have life in the name of Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the clarity of your word. And a topic like this can sometimes feel complicated, can feel like we're in the theological minutia. But Father, there is nothing more central than Christ our Savior. And so I pray that we would think rightly about who Christ is, his nature, what he came to do and accomplish, and that as a result, in believing, as John so badly wants for us, we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we will experience life in his name. Father, I pray that we would worship Christ for who he is, truly God and truly man, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.